you put up a post and it gets 10,000 views, that's a stadium worth of people seeing what you posted. Like that is so rare and it's not going to be like that forever. You have to take advantage of those platforms when, when they have that reach. Welcome to the Startup CPG podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Freitag. Content creation. We all know it's more important than ever, but how do you actually create great content as a brand and measure success? To help us answer these questions, we have David Greenfeld of Dream Pops joining us today. Dream Pops is reimagining cult classic desserts with plant-based ingredients. My current favorite is the frozen cookie dough bites. At the time of recording, Dream Pops has created thousands of TikTok videos with nearly 200,000 followers and over 5 million likes, an Instagram with nearly 100,000 followers, and David has 45,000 LinkedIn followers on his own LinkedIn page, and a podcast with 70 episodes. And he and his team just started getting into YouTube shorts by uploading a mere 500 videos in the last few months. Listen in as David shares about how he got started at Dream Pops and why the branding and name are so intentional. David's early days of using Instagram, then TikTok, LinkedIn, and other platforms. Why content creation is like building a workout routine. How David grew his LinkedIn presence and the content that he finds resonates the most. The importance of regularly testing and evaluating different platforms and how David thinks about driving store velocity. What it was like to start the Stick With Your Dreams podcast why Dream Pops entered the Canadian market, how Dream Pops stays true to their values during tough decisions, and more. And stay tuned at the end of the episode for a mini interview with Safira from Startup CPG Shelfie Award winner, Nowhere Bakery. You won't want to miss her story about getting a text from Gwyneth Paltrow. Hi, David. Welcome to the show today. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Doing really well. I just had one of the chocolate dream pops and then one of the cookie dough bites out of the freezer before I came up to my little podcast recording stop. So I'm I'm feeling great. I just had like the perfect little afternoon snack. Well, I appreciate the support. And uh, yeah, that's that's awesome. Thank you so much for having me and and letting us share our story and a little bit more about Dream Pops um, on Startup CPG's podcast. Yeah, absolutely. I have been a a friend of mine in a LinkedIn friend at some point said, hey, you got to check out Dream Pops. And I immediately became just like, I was like, oh, the like obsessed with the branding. And then I got to try the product. I was like, this is incredible. I actually tried the product first through aisle when you did the campaign with where you could go into the store, buy two, and then you get one, uh, you get Venmoed the, um, the price of one of them. And we can talk more about that campaign later, but that's kind of how I find dream Pop, found dream pops got hooked. So, so honored to have you on the show today to get to talk more about the about the story, about your marketing and would love if on that note, if you could start us off, just like tell us a little bit about yourself and then what is Dream Pops? Yeah. First off, shout out to Chris Tiffin and Isle because what an amazing piece of software they built on that. Yeah. So glad that you used it. Um, and I'd love to hear that because, you know, we, we always want to get new um, folks trying the product and, uh, and it's a really great tool to do that. Um, yeah, a little bit about me. Um, I am a recovering investment banker. I worked in finance for about five years. Before that, I worked for a really uh, inspiring entrepreneur, a guy named Jesse Itzler, um, who was his, was building companies like Zico Coconut Water and Health Warrior, leveraging the power of the internet in the early 2010s. So he was using Facebook and Twitter at the time to compete with some of the largest food and beverage companies in the world. And I fell in love with that idea that you could build a career around creating healthier food and beverage products um, and tapping by by tapping into obviously making an amazing product, but also uh, building a great brand digitally through through social media, through experiential marketing. And uh, and ever since, you know, even when I was in finance, I was looking for that opportunity to take a bet on myself. Um, Why ice cream and candy? It's pretty simple. I have a massive sweet tooth. I uh, I also am lactose intolerant and was vegan for a year. And for me, um, was just looking to replace some of those nostalgic treats like Dippin' Dots and Hagen Dazs bars and Ben and Jerry's pints and Snickers bars. Um, and started with that little spark of of you know passion about confection and indulgence. And it rapidly evolved into where we are today. Awesome. And the different product lines you have, I believe you have the pops and then 
There's the frozen bites. And then now you have a shelf stable candy as well. Is that right? Yes. The new product is called Crunch. It's had a soft launch online direct consumer and we'll be launching more aggressively into retail um, end of December. Awesome. I got to try that at Expo East and was absolutely delicious. I can't remember the member of your team that uh, I did the sampling, but I came by and I was like, can I try one of these? I'm a big fan. And he was like, you got to try them all. Um, And so I got to try all the new the new shelf stable flavors and they were really delicious, really interesting, great texture. Um, So that's I'm really excited to see that grow. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's awesome to hear. So I'm wondering, as you you mentioned being in investment banking and when when it came to starting Dream Pops, like everything feels so intentional. Every interaction that I've had with the Dream Pops branding, when you see the product, it's it has the really unique geometric shapes Is that something that you knew from the very beginning? Did the branding and that feel evolve over time? I'm wondering, because it just, it feels like, I I don't know how to describe it other than it feels like one of the most intentional brands I've ever seen as far as the aesthetic. Like you go to the website, it's all so cohesive. So where did that come from? Well, that's a huge compliment because you see a lot of brands. So thank you. means a lot saying that. Um, I will, to, to me, I, I, I'm, I'm a purist and, uh, I really do approach brand and creative and packaging and any interaction with our brand as an artist. And so, um, it is, it is very intentional. So the product itself started with a geometric popsicle, that geometric shape. And I think I, I look back at, at, at I, I wish I could say it was, it was like all planned out, but really the thing that stood out to me with that geometric pop was some of the most iconic brands in CPG and food and beverage um, are typically products that are a unique form factor or shape that don't require packaging to know what they are. So, for example, a Hershey's Kiss or a Skittle, um, M&M's, uh, Dippin' Dots. There are these products that you actually know what they are without the packaging. And mm. so that mm. popsicle for us was that product. And there was this idea in the early days that Okay, we'll start with the dream pop and then we can build this brand around the pattern and the geometry and the shapes that can be a piece of our identity that can translate into other categories, extensions. But that'll be memorable enough that if people just see that geometric shape, they'll be like, oh, that's a dream pop. And so that's kind of evolved into other products and candy and some of the new frozen innovation um, and definitely very intentional. Yeah. Wow. That's that's really cool. And did in the name as well. Was that something that you, I I believe I've heard you talk about this on in other interviews, the name feels very intentional. It's, it's catchy, it's unique, but also like you have, you know, combinations of words. It seems like it might've been hard to, to land like the, the rights to those. So I'm wondering how you landed on dream pops. Yeah, we had to fight for those in the early days because there's a lot of brands with Dream and Pops. Um, and so, you know, just had to be really careful. I would highly recommend to anyone starting a brand, you know, uh, we did make sure that we could get the trademarks and the design patents and cover ourselves because you can create an, a really incredible product or brand. But if you don't have the intellectual property, then you can't really protect or own anything. And so I really, I see these beautiful brands pop up and, and find out that, you know, there's no trademark attorney or anyone making sure that the, that they can own everything associated with it. So that's definitely an early tip that I, I really recommend uh, people look into. Yeah. And did you do a lot of the art and design yourself or did you work with someone like, it's just, I... I highly encourage everyone to go to the the website and everything because the branding just seriously, like I said before, is so beautiful. I'm wondering if you worked with anyone or if that's something that you came up like you drew on your own. Yeah. So um, back. Sorry, you asked me about the name. The name kind of started with like we were trying to figure out what, what we wanted to stand for. American dream, dream big, go after your dreams. So this kind of whimsical anything is possible type of a mood board and you know dream pops it was obviously a popsicle but the word pop can be uh you know a sound it can extend beyond just a popsicle and so dream pops together usually two syllables uh starbucks nike uh some some of those really iconic brands have two syllables and so uh it just rolled off the tongue and we all you know that 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 was it um in terms of the brand itself it's been an evolution um starting with a little pattern that emerged in the early days on we had like these plastic bags with stickers on them um and the font 
evolved and the crown of that 100% plant-based evolved and came in pretty early on. Um, but yeah, that pattern, we worked with a company um, in 2017, Paper White, that came up with that initial pattern. And then we did work with Hatch, uh, who brought the brand to where it is today um, in that that rebrand. Wow, that's that's really cool. And I wonder if you can describe kind of the stage that you're at now, because many of the brands in our community, are they're just getting started and you're a little bit further down the road, I think, than a lot of our community members. So I wonder if you can tell us about like the stage you're at now, like how many stores you're in, maybe a couple of the major retailers and like what kind of challenges are top of mind for you at this stage of the company? Yeah. So we're in about 6,000 doors, um, primarily natural and specialty accounts. Uh, our biggest customer is Whole Foods, Wegmans, Erewhon, Bristol Farms, Lassen's, a lot of those amazing Cinderella, you know, great regional grocery stores. Um, we are now moving into more big box and conventional stores, um, but being very disciplined in that. And, you know, definitely growing on last mile delivery platforms. We are in Canada, which has been an amazing market. And if you have the right brokers and team members in place, I highly recommend exploring Canada when the time is right. Um, but yeah, so we are, we're at this really fun inflection point where we have great data. We're seeing how the business is growing and, 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 and making sure to take strategic bets not just put the brand and product everywhere, really put them in places that we think they'll be successful. Right. What And what percentage of the, the business is retail versus, I know you just launched more of the direct-to-consumer shelf-stable product. How much is retail versus direct-to-consumer? Cons- I'd say it's almost like 90, 97%, 95 to 97% retail, like wholesale grocery business. So we've never really been a huge D2C business um, that will change with the candy product and it's growing. Um, But as of right now, we're mainly a retail focused company. Right. Okay. And I believe you had, you had thought early on that maybe it could be direct to consumer with frozen, but I think that there was some challenges with that and then pivoting to retail. Is that right? Yeah. Initially we wanted to be the, the daily harvest of ice cream. And, you know, we were really excited about the Harry's and the Casper's and the Warby's, and uh, I think a lot of people were trying to figure out how does the internet impact brand development and company creation. And quickly we realized after making ice cream ourselves and putting them in boxes with dry ice, trying to figure out frozen 3PLs, that it just was not going to be a scalable model unless we raised 50 to $100 million. And so really quickly after a few months, we turned off D2C and we just went right, right into grocery stores and started selling in. Um, and after launching at Air One and Bristol Farms and Whole Foods, we realized that that's, that's where we were going to win, not not on frozen direct to consumer. Right. And then you're so digging into your marketing and your social media presence and you you have you've had a podcast, you have um, like last I there's thousands and TikTok videos on LinkedIn. You have a huge presence. And so and being that focused on retail and then having these online presences and using that to drive retail. I'm curious to dig into that. And I'm wondering kind of, you know, what maybe was first, like, I know you've done work on Instagram, LinkedIn, like I said, podcast, TikTok, what was any of those first of like, you know what, I think that this brand that we need to do something online, we should pick a platform or did you try multiple at once? Like, where did that kind of originate of being like, let's really build build in public or let's, you know, let's get connect with our consumers using these platforms? Yeah. Number one was, was Instagram. So we, we worked with a team called Swim Social. Shout out to Elena. She's amazing. Her team's amazing. In 2016, and we're just building the brand on Instagram and looking at what companies like Alfred Coffee and, and some of these other brands were doing to drive strong engagement and followership. Um, once we built that core Instagram following and community and aesthetic, um, we started to look at other platforms. And so um, I've just always been of the mindset that, you know, and this is probably from seeing what Jesse and the team at 100 Mile Group were doing in 2010 was, you know, the internet opens up so many different opportunities for impressions, for brand discovery. So let's figure out how Dream Pops can exist across different mediums, whether that's written content on LinkedIn. And so on LinkedIn, and like three years ago when I was posting, 
I just we just started see such, seeing such strong engagement and the idea with all the buyers, a lot of investors, a lot of consumers are on LinkedIn. This is really like a, a B2B community of people that maybe would even buy Dream Pops and put them in their grocery stores. And so we're like, okay, we're going to create thought leadership content and content around CPG that B2B thought leaders would care about. And then hopefully that translates to interest in the brand, but also let's showcase other brands. And so the podcast I did was actually interviewing other founders in CPG on LinkedIn Live. And that really worked and cultivated a strong community. Uh, at the same time, we're like, well, if this works for LinkedIn, then let's look at TikTok, which was getting a lot of hype. That seems more like passive entertainment consumption, like television. So let's create content that's kind of funny and odd and more education or uh, entertainment oriented and try a lot. And that's where we went high volume with our team at the time and just started getting crazy uh, organic reach, um, follower growth. And it was like, wow, okay, there's a new, there's a TV channel. Um, LinkedIn is this like business B2B channel. Uh, Instagram is kind of like a magazine. Um, then we dabbled with Clubhouse for a while and that, you know, we got some growth there and then we realized that that wasn't scalable and it wasn't working. Um, we did po- we were, we did 70 episodes of podcasts that were on Spotify, uh, that, that, was another channel. Um, and then, you know, more recently have, have dabbled with YouTube and YouTube shorts. And so I think it's just a matter of trying out new mediums, looking at the data and telling your story. And that compounds over years to, to create brand growth. Right. And you, cr- you do your own manufacturing. Is that right? And does that help kind of have a, have a well to draw from for content? Yeah. So exactly. And we, we were like, well, what are we going to create content about? And the easiest answer to that is if you just document everything that you're doing, oftentimes you think it's not interesting, but most people don't see what it's like delivering ice cream that melts to grocery stores or being in a factory and pasteurizing or mixing product. And so, yeah, we just started trying everything and started to notice that the best um, engagement was when it was just authentic storytelling of what we were doing every day. And then on your question, we started making Dream Pops in my mom's kitchen. Um, we then moved into four different commercial facilities where we had three people on the line, six people on the line, 15 people on the line. And then now we have a network of manufacturers across the country making product. And it's more of a uh, co-packed as opposed to us every day. Making, uh, we don't make it ourselves. We have custom lines that make the product. Okay. Was that more challenging to to get and get content once you move to the more co-manufacturing model since it's not your own facility? Is that still, is that something you have to work with facilities to like get content that you can use? Yeah, we still do a lot of R&D ourselves though. So you can film the Mm R&D and yeah, we do film a lot at at co-packers or current manufacturers. Um, And then we'll also just film other like product focused content or educational content uh, from running the business day to day at the office. So yeah, I going on your TikTok channel is like a danger. Like I encourage everyone to do it, but it's a d- dangerous uh, time vortex that you may fall into because just like seeing the chocolate poured, like I like I can watch food be manufactured all day. And maybe it's because I'm a nerd in this industry, but like just seeing the chocolate poured on, I'm like, oh, that's amazing. Then there's funny videos. There's one where you were like taking out your employees trash and um, and then there was a voiceover. Like there's just it's there's it's funny, it's informational, like it's interesting, there's beautiful content with the product being made. So it's just it's really cool to see the like variety of content and then just the volume. Thank you. Yeah, that and that's what I would just recommend is I see a lot of people be like, Man, I've been posting on TikTok for the last few weeks and it's just not working. Well, you know, we've been posting for years and I, I just would say, yes, there's more people on the platform, but it's really a volume game. And the, we've figured out kind of a formula of, oh, you know, the, the videos that are like how stuff works that used to be on TV uh, that show the big machinery and mixers like those typically do really well or uh, something with a trending funny sound. Um, that has a little bit of a storyboard or a script behind it is going to do well. Um, so you have to learn off of trial. Mm-hmm. And a little bit like by different platforms like TikTok, for example, um, you know, so like how many videos, you know, would you say you have on on TikTok? And then like, what does that look like for your team to create? Is it creating a certain number of videos per day or week? Like, how do you 
How do you structure creating that content? Is there anything that you've learned over time that you recommend for brands trying to like get in the in the habit of posting to TikTok or make it a regular part of their process? Yeah, we started out. It was me and Josh uh, who was you know running our marketing. Uh, it was me and him in a room, and we were just like, we need to each make one to three TikToks a day, and then have enough content that we can post for the week. Then it's evolved into getting freelancers or other creators to make a bank of content, putting that into a you know a Dropbox or a centralized cloud shared storage, and then just like using a platform like a Later.com or a, a content scheduler to make sure that it goes out every day, because consistency and cadence do compound. Versus you can't just post 100 videos in one day and expect it to can do well for the algorithm. Right. I've heard you compare getting used to posting on social like an athlete, like building a muscle. Yeah, I believe that. I know it sounds a little crazy, but, um, you know, it's it doesn't when you force yourself to write a post on LinkedIn or create a piece of content on TikTok or post a static photo or a reel on Instagram. It's just like making yourself be creative every day and figure out how you're gonna express your brand, your, your vision for the brand. And so um, I, I do think you, like there are a lot of people that think it's a waste of time, but I think it's, I think, you know, based on the reaction, it, it, it obviously shows the intent and the obsession with, with brand. So. Mm -hmm. And for LinkedIn as well, I think I've seen from a lot of people that have really grown their following on LinkedIn and that, that in the early days, they had people being like, what are you doing? Like, why are you posting on LinkedIn? Who posts on LinkedIn? I think it's like less than, I think it's less than 1% of people that have creator mode turned on on LinkedIn. And then around, you know, 1% that like actually post on LinkedIn versus just kind of actively scrolling or engaging. So like when you were getting started on LinkedIn, was it a little daunting? Were people like, what are you doing? Like, what was it like to get started? Yeah, I would just compare it to what people thought when I quit finance and was sampling popsicles at Erewhon or showing up at different events. Um, absolutely. All my colleagues were like, why are you doing that? You know, this is weird. Stop posting on LinkedIn. It's not a social network. Um, the truth is, though, like, if you want to really do something radical and different and, you know, build uh, a business like this, in my mind, you need to think differently and just not care what other people think. Um, and for me, it was like really uncomfortable in the early days to put myself so out there, but now it's, um, it's just, it's fun. I enjoy it. Um, and I just don't really care what other people think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, would you, would you encourage other founders in this space to like get active on LinkedIn? It sounds like you've been able to connect with retailers and investors. So it seems like it's been a great platform for you. Yeah. I, I think that they're, you're just leaving opportunity on the table. I mean, one piece of content could get 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 views, one buyer from, Whole Foods or Target or Walmart or someone might see it and bring you in. And, and to be frank, like those things have happened a lot and they happen more as you do it at scale. So uh, I would recommend like, here's the other fun piece of it. It's all free. Now with Elon buying Twitter and charging for verified check marks, I wouldn't be surprised if soon all these platforms start charging. But mm -hmm. while it is free and you can reach millions, like you put up a post and it gets 10,000 views. That's a stadium worth of people seeing what you posted. Like that is so rare and it's not going to be like that forever. Instagram used to be like that, but you have to take advantage of those platforms when, when they have that reach. Yeah. I, I even saw uh, encouragement from someone on LinkedIn. They're like, when you're getting started on LinkedIn and, you know, maybe you only get three likes. They're like, think about when you worked in a corporate office, how many times did, did three people come by and give you a high five in a day? Like, wouldn't that be the most incredible day at the office? Like you got three likes, like even that is, you know, huge. And then, like you said, you have the opportunity to talk to stadiums filled with people. So it's definitely a little bit of a mind shift, like uh, mind, yeah, mindset shift, but there's so much opportunity there. Yeah. It, it, and I get it. Like I used to care so much when people would like make fun or mock what I was doing. But what I would say is the more that you continue to bet on yourself, like it, it, it tends to work itself out. If you really are obsessed and trying to create something that's, you know, a game changer or truly better and impacts a lot of people, um, then it, it'll start to really work and compound and you'll get feedback and meet great people. That want to help right and as a as the founder did, would you say that 
like as you've posted content, have you seen any trends of like people really connecting with you sharing about the industry or you sharing about the story or what it's like to be a founder? Has there any like types of content that have kind of been like unique to what you've been able to create as the founder of the company that you found really resonated on on LinkedIn, especially? Yeah, the posts that do the best um, are typically when I get really raw and share like everything that went wrong. <laughs> you know, I think mm-hmm. there was one one post I put up that showed I was making I was in Chicago delivering product to just a, a, a 15 chain store, uh, Pete's Market. And as I was doing it, I had dry ice in the car. I had a big container full of product and I opened the door and all the ice cream fell on the floor. And I was so upset. But then I was like, you know what, I'm gonna take a photo of this and just post it and tell people what happened. And a lot of people were like, wow, this this is like what it's really like, not all the wins and successes, you know, when you're really sharing the crap and, and, and the pain and, you know, melted product or a recipe gone wrong or issues. And that that's what it's really all about. That's what people are dealing with every single day. So I think the authentic content, I see a lot of other great people on LinkedIn sharing that. That's what really resonates. Mm-hmm. This is a quick little midway break to tell you a little more about Nowhere Bakery, who I'll be talking with at the end of the episode. Nowhere Bakery was one of our Shelfie Award winners and makes allergen-friendly baked goods that taste anything but healthy. I first heard about Nowhere from a family member who was obsessed with their cookie collaboration with Rachel's Good Eats. I got to meet the founders at the Shelfie Awards online networking event, and they were kind enough to send me a box of all the goodies. I can safely say those are all gone now. The chocolate chip cookies were on another level. They have a holiday pack available now as well, including a collab with Gwyneth Paltrow. So stay tuned at the end to hear more from founder Safira. And then you mentioned a little bit YouTube shorts. I saw you even post on LinkedIn today when, as we're recording this about YouTube shorts, like, is that something that you're taking a different strategy than TikTok to? Is it some similar content? How are you approaching YouTube shorts? The same way that we approached Instagram, LinkedIn, Clubhouse, TikTok, Pinterest, it's testing and learning and just getting your hands dirty. Um, You know, YouTube Shorts, uh, testing tons of videos. I think we've put up 500 or so in in a couple months because we saw the the opportunity and the reach reminds me of TikTok three years ago. And so Mm. um, once again, YouTube is arguably even more exciting because it feeds into Google and SEO on Google. Um, And so there's just a whole new world of potential people that could discover the brand. Right. Yeah. Do you have any tips for for like many of the founders in our community, you know, their teams smaller than five people, often just themselves and a co-founder. I think creating content can be daunting of like, how do I create time for that? Or how do I do that on my own? Do you have any tips for how to maximize either using outside help or just set up your day as a founder to like to make it just part of what you do and make it not so overwhelming? Yeah, it's only overwhelming because I used to get overwhelmed by it too, because it's unknown and scary. And you're like, I don't know how to do this. But like, the beauty is all you have to do is just spend time in the app and try and not be scared to look stupid. And Google like videos, you can look up YouTube videos on how to make great TikToks or how to use YouTube shorts. There's really good tutorial videos, or you can get one really young person. Um, typically I, like I've had a couple of people that, you know, they were in college and, and or younger and they are really good at the app that I will meet at a conference or a trade show or through friends. And I will just say, Hey, can I like get an hour of your time for you to show me exactly how you use the app and kind of teach me and mentor me on, on the medium. And that's worked out really well. Yeah. Well, that's that's super helpful. And then I'm curious about you. You mentioned your podcast and then it sounds like it was LinkedIn live sessions. Can you talk a little bit about deciding to start that? Did, you know, was it something you just kind of again, like went for? Did you have to do any editing? Like curious about like, you know, getting started with a, a podcast as a brand and, you know, 70 episodes is no small number. So that's that's really cool. would love to learn a little bit more about starting that. Yeah, there's great technology like Riverside FM. Um, there's a couple other I'm blanking on that you can use. You just record a podcast. Um, I dabbled with getting freelancers, like the cheapest I could find to make episodes. And then I realized that the most cost effective way to do it was to just film the episode on LinkedIn live and then output it and you know use an intro and cut it up and 
do it as cheap as possible because it doesn't have to be like the most amazing episode with all the bells and whistles. It's about the quality of the actual content. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, um, yeah, the way the podcast started was I was just LinkedIn messaging or DMing founders to learn from them, buy them coffee, buy them lunch. Uh, The same way I mentioned about influencers, you know, I was like, if I, if we want to increase the odds of being successful here, I'm going to reach out to people who I think are the most successful in food and beverage and CPG that are five to 10 years ahead of me and have done it. And I'm just going to ask for, pay for, ask for 30 minutes of their time to give me advice. And I was like, wow, this, these sessions are so powerful. Should probably record them and just share them to other people who are building businesses in this space. Seems like a good thing to do. Um, and then I just really enjoyed it and kept doing it. Yeah. Wow. I mean, and did you, were most of your guests just all like cold outreach or meeting people at events and, and cause you had some, you've had some really big, big brands on the show. And was that just all outreach on your own? Yeah. It started with Steven Eisen, who's, you know, one of my best friends and an, an investor and partner in dream pops. Um, he built a company called Loki. So, you know, started with uh, the night Ashley Thompson from Mush, who is a great friend, built an amazing business and just leveraging the network. You know, I think getting that first guest is really important. So uh, sometimes asking for a favor um, and, and a lot of, you know, people will do it. And it's it's helpful for the founder too to, to tell their story and get their story out there. Um, but yeah, cold LinkedIn emails and messages. And once you've done two or three or five episodes and you have maybe a reputable brand on there too, it's a lot easier for that next person to to co-sign. Right. Yeah, I definitely, I'll link in the the show notes to your podcast because there's so many incredible episodes. I think my favorite so far that I listened to is with GT Dave because I'm a huge GT Living Foods kombucha fan. I've listened to almost every interview that GT Dave has done, but I hadn't listened to yours. And I was like, I like, I was like, I dropped everything uh, to listen to, to that interview. It was so good. And, and, but other interviews on your shows, there's just so much good content. So I'll definitely link that because I encourage our listeners to go check out your show and listen to some of the, the interviews. It's really cool that you not only were learning for yourself, but then able to share with others what you were learning and then also get so many, you know, other ancillary benefits from it. Thank you, Jesse. Yeah, I appreciate it. And it's kind of what you're doing here, right? Like these are just really awesome conversations. Um, and if they help others in who are facing similar challenges or trying to build, you know, a company in the same space, I think it's, it's always exciting to be able to pass that on. Oh yeah, for sure. That's how I originally got into into podcasting was with my own show uh, during the pandemic. And I was like having these great virtual conversations with people. And I was like, wait, the technology exists to record this. And then maybe other people will listen. And yeah, it's just amazing to be able to share resources and conversations. So I, I'm, it's obvious I'm biased toward loving podcasts, uh, but yeah, so I just think that that's so cool. And I love seeing other, other, fa- you know, we've had Ali uh, from in the sauce on the show and, you know, we've had uh, the awesome sauce uh, guys in our community, Carl and Paul, they have their own podcast. So I just love seeing from the brand side, the podcast content. It's just really neat. Yeah, no, I, I and there's a lot. Of, I feel like there's been a lot of founders doing it. And it's really impressive um, to do that while building the company is not an easy feat. So kudos to, yeah. to, to all of those folks. I'm wondering how with with all of your content out in the world, and then also being in 6,000 retailers, is there anything that you that you do or work on to track like how your content is driving velocities in store? Like if you're launching in a new store, is there a content strategy that you take? Like how do you see those two fitting together also, you know, versus the the brand building awareness that you're getting? Like how is velocity related to the content and how do you measure any of that? It's really hard to do. I mean, there's a lot of people trying to build technology to solve for that. Um, you know, there's everything from geo-targeted ad spend, which you can see if there are lifts based on promos or couponing or aisle. Um, you know, you can work on a podcast that targets certain audiences or regions or zip codes really close to specific retailers. I would say it's really hard to see it. My gut and inclination is instead of being able to track true lift, um, you can just look at the data and say, okay, if I'm engaging with these types of audiences, these X million impressions, 
and I can, and it's consistently compounding and doing that, it's going to bleed through into someone maybe hearing about it or trying the product. And then that leads to velocity and sales. Mm -hmm. And have you, have you dabbled with different paid campaigns like geo-targeted ads, like you mentioned, and I'd definitely love to dig into more about aisle, but curious about the, you know, some of the paid advertising pieces. Yeah, I mean, we've dabbled with paid shopper marketing, uh, geo-targeted ads, experiential marketing, uh, demos. The truth is, uh, everything is 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 all of these are are good ways to build brand. It's just there are only so many hours in the day, and a lot of it can be very expensive. And so, um, you know, performance marketing is extremely expensive right now. The iOS update has really hurt the ability to track, you know, return on ad spend. Mm -hmm. Um, And demos can be pretty expensive. Shopper marketing can be expensive. I think it's just knowing when to turn on and off levers, testing. Um, I wish I, I think the playbook changes every 12 months, six to 12 months. So I don't think there's a good answer. Like it could be a great time to advertise on Pinterest or TikTok. And then six to 12 months later, YouTube or Facebook. Um, so I don't. I, I wish there was a better right answer. It's changed even since we started the company multiple times. Is there a way that you either like questions that you ask yourself or the team or how do you kind of evaluate like what the new playbook is, what's working, how big, you know, if you're like, is it time to demo again? You know, how big of tests do you do? Like, how do you think through those decisions? Because there may not be, you know, the, the the right answer or right answers are always changing. But I'm wondering about your framework for how you think about evaluating what you're doing next. It's all tied to data. So spins data, Nielsen data, um, being able to look at how product is performing. Um, you can then look at different promotions on the calendar and how that affects the velocities of the dollars for TDP. You can look at demos that you did. You can look at out-of-home campaigns, radio, television, if you do those. We don't necessarily do those. But um, the truth is we are always looking at that velocity metric and uh, natural enhanced, which is a natural specialty set, and MULO, which is multi-unit. Uh, which is more conventional, and then U.S. food, which is also conventional. So looking at segments of data as your North Star, and then pulling marketing levers to see how they're being affected, how the velocities and dollars per TDP are being affected. Right. And can you talk a little bit about the campaign that you did with Isle, a little bit more about how it works? Obviously, it worked on me, um, but I'm curious to, you know, to hear your perspective of how you evaluated doing that program, and then if there was a specific you know, set of stores or area you were targeting, would love to hear more. Yeah, we're still in the early innings on that. So it's just a a matter of getting people to text and try a product uh, as a redemption. There's platforms like Ibotta that do similar things. Visor is an awesome company that actually rewards you for working out and then gives you a redemption after you've worked out as well as a donation. Um, So, you know, with Isle, that that campaign was targeted at specific geo-targeted regions. Um, and we're just constantly looking for new ways to get people to, to try or redeem a coupon or, or try a problem. Yeah, I think that I'm very excited to see where the different coupon methods continue to go. We've had, uh, we've talked a lot about social nature on the show and having, you know, that go to consumers, the targeted t- redeeming a free sample in the store. And then with aisle, like when I, I, my first experience with Isle was, was actually trying Dream Pops. And then I tried another product this week, but it's just incredible to be able to be like, oh, I got a targeted ad. It says, do I want to try this? Yes, absolutely. And then it texts you, which store do you want to go to? Here's the stores by your house. Drive to the store, buy it, take a picture of the receipt, send it back. And it goes, we'll Venmo you in the next 24 hours. And I got my redemption within like two hours. It just magically appeared in my Venmo. And I was like, this is so cool. Like to have these other options beyond conventional demoing, which there can be a place for, for sure. But there's just so many other ways to drive trial now. And it's very interesting. Yep. It's really exciting. I mean, this is where technology is 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 100% influencing retail level consumption. Um, I think Instacart, GoPuff, DoorDash, Gatier, Gorillas. Like they're all radically disrupting grocery as well. And so it'll be interesting to watch how that evolves. Yeah. I'm also wondering if you could share a little bit about the decision to expand into Canada, because it sounds like that's been a good bet. You mentioned at the beginning that it's something you recommend. Um, But I think that you don't see a lot of brands necessarily unless they start in Canada doing that. And I think you've got, you know, 700 plus and that may be old data stores in 
in Canada. And so I'm interested to learn about, you know, how you were like, let's, let's do this. Let's go for that. What did that look like? Yeah. Initially when we did it, we got a lot of pushback um, because it, it can be a really bad move if you're not ready from a supply chain perspective. Um, they're also, it's, you know, French and English packaging, different packaging, different regulatory um, concerns or adjustments. Um, but you know, for us, what we've seen in Canada is just less competition, great customers, um, the, the, the products performing well. I think it's category specific. I think it's brand specific. But also, if you build a great digital brand, then it might translate well into Canada. And so not being scared to, to give it a shot uh, that it's just it's been an amazing um, growth opportunity for us. And, and we we do plan on, on doubling down. Yeah, very interesting. And. Does that affect any of your, are your marketing strategies different in the Canadian market or is it similar to what you're doing in the U.S. market? I'd say very similar. Shopper marketing, merchandising, demos, geo-targeted ad spend. So similar. Yeah. Do, do you use a, a team of uh, merchandisers to, to help around the country? Do you use different, do you use services for that or use your own team for merchandising? We've worked with a number of different merchandisers. Um, I think, you know, it's really, merchandising is very important. It can also be super expensive. And mm -hmm. so just turning them on and off as needed for launches, having them constantly is is just far too expensive. Yeah, that that makes sense. Um, I'm also wondering, I, I think I've heard you talk about that, that you're, I believe you're a fan of like athletes and, and watching their progression and getting better. And I'm wondering if you can talk about just your mindset of growth and growing yourself and the company and, and, you know, what, what inspires you in that area? Yeah. I mean, I definitely see entrepreneurship and building a company as a sport. Like I, I, I love it. I wake up every day. I feel like it's, you know, you're training, you're working towards these crazy goals every single quarter and year. Um, you know, you're showing up to trade shows, you're demoing, you're pitching sales meetings and investors. And um, it's, it's really important to have, you know, some balance or focus on mental wellness and taking care of yourself. Because, you know, I would say it's a 10 plus year game if you really want to build one of these companies. And so to any early emerging founders, um, just know that this isn't something you can just, it's, it's really hard. I don't, I don't think you can do this as a side project, like unless you want it to be a lifestyle business. Um, but I just don't believe that you can really compete at the highest level if you're not all in. Yeah. Uh, I'm also wondering if there are any questions that you ask yourself when evaluating a tough decision, like something tough has come up at the business, or it could even be, be personal, but I, I'm always curious to hear the questions that people maybe ask themselves to decide what to do next or when they're at a bit of a crossroads. What helps you kind of navigate what to do next? Yeah, I think we have, I mean, we have this value system that Dream Pops and like what the brand stands for. And we continue to like invest in that. And so every hard decision is like, okay, how is this going to impact our community of consumers? Is this going to ruin the integrity of the brand? And if that answer is it ruins the integrity, then we can't do it um, because you need to have non-negotiables. Um, you need to stand for something. Trust is what a brand is at the end of the day. And so there have been hard calls where, you know, whether it's a retailer wanting something or, um, you know, opportunities to extend into other lines that, you know, sometimes what you say no to is what determines what your brand is. Right. And then is there anything coming up uh, later this year that you want to share about anything that we should be looking for retailer launches or maybe you can't. Um, Maybe uh, some might not be public yet, but kind of curious what we should keep an eye out for next for Dream Pops. Yeah, new flavors of our frozen bites. So we got our mint chip and our banana cream rolling out across the country. Um, our candy products will be hitting shelves. So the crunch will be in stores uh, end of December, early January. Um, and then some new frozen innovation that we're uh, that we're cooking up and working on. But uh, you know, it's I don't have any big retailers I can share right now, but very soon I'll be able to. So awesome. That's super exciting. I cannot wait to try all all the latest uh, Dream Pops projects uh, and products. So that's for sure. Thank you. Appreciate that. So, yeah, make sure to go to Dream Pops spelled just as it sounds dot com. And then also on Instagram at Dream Pops. Make sure I'll link to David's LinkedIn in the show no notes. I'll link to the 
Dream Pops TikTok. So all the good content, the podcast will be in the show notes for everyone. And just definitely hope that everyone goes and checks out the brand. Um, I'll also link a couple of my other favorite interviews with David since you've put so much great content out in the world. So just really appreciate all the sharing and connecting and that you do for this, you know, CPG community and coming on the show to talk with our community specifically, just really, really appreciate it. And I'm so excited to continue to follow the journey. Yeah, of course. And, you know, anyone who is in the startup CPG community, please reach out on LinkedIn or on email or whatever it is. Um, I'm always here to help. I've had three people that have helped me and um, I love helping founders uh, make it happen and, and learn from our mistakes, but also some of the things that we've done right. Awesome. Thank you so much, David. Yeah, thanks for having me. Don't head out just yet. Keep listening for an interview with Nowhere Bakery founder Safira Rosti that I'm excited to share with you. Hi, Safira. Welcome to the show today. So glad to have you here. How are you? I'm doing well, JC. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's so nice to have you here. We got to meet very briefly virtually after the Shelfie Awards. Um, which was super fun. So it's get fun to get to see you in person uh, or, you know, virtually again. And we had like a family get together this past weekend from when we're recording as a like early, um, early holiday meal. And uh, Nowhere Bakery came up because, uh, which I mentioned in a previous episode, my sister-in-law is a huge fan and actually introduced me to your brand originally. So um, yeah, we had a whole conversation about how much we we love Nowhere Bakery, which was really fun. Oh, that's amazing. I love that. Um, yeah, so I and I have been trying all the products. You sent us a wonderful sampler box that is all now gone. Um, and we had some household uh, arguments over who got the rest of everything. Um, I think all the <laughs> cookies were like our favorite, like the chocolate chip cookie and the double chocolate chip cookie. But like, they're all incredible. So. Yeah, would love if you could just tell us a little bit about your founding story and how you got started. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how far you want to go back, but to give you a bit of context, I, in my early 20s, I developed really bad gut issues, which means that I had to eliminate a lot of uh, different kinds of things from my diet, including gluten, dairy, refined sugars, soy, like all the fun stuff that's in dessert. But I've always had like a huge sweet tooth. So I got to the kitchen and I just started making a lot of desserts that I could, that my gut could tolerate, got really creative, looked online, did a lot of research about like vegan recipes, grain-free recipes, and just like, just started creating things. And from there, I got really passionate about just making healthy dessert. And so I started like a food blog. And this was probably 10 years ago now. And so as you do, make an Instagram page, started sharing recipes on there, got really into it and formed a career out of that. I started doing food blogging, recipe development for companies, and then it turned into catering as well. When I was doing catering jobs in LA, I met one of my husband's friends who was a food delivery company owner. He did paleo food delivery company. And he saw my desserts and he was like, yo, can you come and do desserts for my company? Like we don't do desserts, but our customers want them. Can you like just come in and like make some stuff in our kitchen? And it took me about a year to come around because I just wasn't really like ready to get into like that kind of business. And so the start of 2020, I was in a bit of a lull with my career. And so I reached out to him and I said, do you still want us to or me to create these desserts to you? He's like, yeah, come on by, bring over like 10 or so samples and we can do like a taste test and we can like decide on a menu. So I created a bunch of recipes, went down to the kitchen in Costa Mesa. I was in LA at the time. So I drove down there and met with him. He tasted all of the different types of desserts that I, I brought in. And he was like, dude, like these are way too good for me to take credit for them. Like you need to create a business on your own. And I was like, I don't even know the first thing about how to do this. Like I don't have a kitchen. Like I, I'm new to America. So the whole business side of like setting everything up was a little bit foreign to me as well. And he said, look, like if you come in to my kitchen, you can just use a small corner while my guys are working, start from ground zero and just see how you go. And so that was right before the pandemic started. And so I think it was almost good timing because people were all at home on their phones. They didn't want to leave the house. I was making these cookies for my friend's company. I made an Instagram page. I started sharing on Instagram and people were like, 
where can I get these? Can you deliver them to me? And I was like, yes, 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 yes. So it started out with me making them myself, hand delivering around LA, Orange County, wherever anyone needed it. And then that kind of turned into someone asking, hey, can you like ship these to me across the country? I was like, sure, why not? So I started doing that as well. And within about, I'd say three months, I was just inundated and over my head for what I could handle. I ended up waking up for about a year. I was getting up at 2 a.m. to drive down to Orange County, which is about an hour drive, to make everything in this one day. I'd bake it, I'd pack it, I'd ship it, I'd hand deliver it, drive home, sleep, eat, repeat. And uh, yeah, that was essentially how everything started and then my husband saw just how exhausted I was these few months and he was like can I come and help you and so he essentially came on what was initially going to be just for him to like come and give like a hand here and there he now co-runs the business with me and uh, he heads up like the wholesale and marketing side of things wow that's incredible that's that's so cool and so do you do you still uh like where do you make the products now and do you have help uh, with the baking what's funny is we're actually still in the same facility so it started out with me in the corner and then it moved to okay we're going to do one full day in the kitchen because he was only operating in that space four days a week but it was his space and so we went from one day to two days as orders grew two days to three days as orders grew and then his company actually went under um in may of this year so we ended up taking over the lease and so we're in that same space now full time um in costa mesa and i'd say we have about six staff members right now but i've just come from the kitchen like i'm still there i'm still looking over everything i still touch everything where it's there he's packing up all the orders and doing all the wholesale stuff so we're very much hands-on yeah wow Uh, that's that's amazing. And uh, can you tell us about some of your like fun collaborations that you've done as well? I've seen your like hype drops, uh, you know, of uh, of your products. I I love I love seeing those. Yeah, I mean, we've done some amazing collaborations with a bunch of different food bloggers. I think what having my background has been really helpful because I've got that community already of food bloggers that I already know. So it started out with me asking a friend if she wanted to do a collaboration. And this was nearly two years ago. And that went so well that we've decided to kind of do like an ongoing thing where we'll partner with a different influencer, make like a fun recipe with them and just release it for like a short amount of time. Um, Our most recent one is actually with Gwyneth Paltrow. So that released about two weeks ago and it's a holiday sampler and so yeah we essentially work with her to make three holiday flavored cookies um and we're offering them to christmas wow that's amazing that's like to go from food bloggers that you know to gwyneth paltrow that's a lot like did you like have a connection or just over time did you get the recognition of you've worked with like rachel's good eats and like all these incredible people like it just kind of grow to like you know, to these celebrity level? Yeah, it was it was a interesting chain of events that led to this. Essentially, we had done a collaboration with um, Ariel Laurie, and she had been working out with the same trainer that Gwyneth Paltrow was working out with. And so when we did the collaboration with her, she was like, I'd love to gift her a box of these cookies. So I made, made the box, I carried it to her trainer, and a trainer gave it to Gwyneth. <laughs> And we heard nothing from it. Months went by, not a word. And then one day I get a text from Gwyneth Paltrow and she's like, hi, I hope you don't mind. I got your number from my trainer. I love those cookies that you gave me. Like, can I order some more? And so that was kind of like how it started. And then I suggested to her a few months ago, I was like, hey, would you like to do a collaboration? And she was like, yeah, I'd love to. Like, any way I can support you guys. So, wow. Yeah, that's really how it happened. That's amazing. Getting a text from Gwyneth Paltrow saying that uh, she loved your cookies. Oh, my goodness. It was so surreal. <laughs> yeah. Um. I'm also curious, like, because you you made, you know, made the cookie, making the cookies and catering and and delivering them locally. And then you started shipping. Was there was it tough to figure out any of the packaging or like, you know, how to make it last a couple of days to go through the mail? Was that was that difficult? Has that been difficult? Yeah, a lot of this has been honestly just trial and error. Um, and I think it was probably a, a good thing that we offered it so early on because we weren't we didn't have a huge customer base. So we had initially um, 
sent our cookies via USPS. We could figure out that they're not so reliable. Um, so we've, along the way, we've just like slowly improved our process more and more to offer, you know, very um, express shipments so that people can get their product quickly. And especially during the summer, you know, we make sure we send with ice and liners and yeah, anything we can do to make sure that the customer gets their items uh, fresh and not melted uh, because we don't use any, you know, preservatives and we use real chocolate. Our products are very prone to melting. Um, so yeah, it's it's been, been a journey. <laughs> I love the packaging and everything that you have, though, getting your fun pink box in the mail and the the little, you know, the cookie packaging is pink, too. Like the branding and everything, it's all very like fun and inviting and exciting to receive in the mail. So I love how you've how you've set that up. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, when I initially created it, I mean, that was it was like a no brainer of, of to what the color would be and what the logo would be. And it kind of just all worked. We've somewhat adjusted our materials that the design itself has always stayed the same and i think what a lot of food brands don't really do is like think about the aesthetics of everything and you know we are not just a cookie company a dessert company but it's like more of like a fashion company as well we like everything to look really aesthetically pleasing yeah that's a really good point point. and when did you find startup cpg and you know and then uh, yeah, curious about when that happened. Yeah, so when we were living in LA, I would drive down um, at sometimes three times a week. So I had a lot of driving time. And so I would listen to a lot of these um, business podcasts on my drives. And even when I'm in the kitchen, especially early in the morning on my own, I'd have my earbuds in and I'd just listen to different business podcasts. And so I found Startup CPG Podcast um, when I was looking through uh, iTunes. And yeah, I found out found out about the Slack channel through there. And it's just been such a great community to get involved with and learn so much about the industry. That's amazing. I love that you found us through the podcast and are now on the podcast. Like that's that's so cool. It's so so awesome to have you here. Uh, especially after you found us like that. That's amazing. Yeah, it's a true blessing. Um I'm also curious if you can tell us the story of the name Nowhere cuz I love hearing the story of how you came up with that name with your um with your husband and your uh, you know different uh, dietary uh, journeys. Yes. So, you know, going back to the fact that I had a lot of gut issues, I obviously couldn't eat a lot of things that were quote unquote enjoyable to most people and my husband also has a big sweet tooth and could eat what he likes to say is a razor blade he has the <laughs> he has like the stomach of you know like a rock and so we would often butt heads when it came to dessert time because he didn't like these desserts that were quote unquote healthy because they tasted healthy you know like mm -hmm. the texture wasn't there the taste wasn't there it tasted like coconut or dates or whatever it was and so a treat that satisfied both of our needs was nowhere to be found and that's that's why we created that that's essentially how it all came to mold together yeah i love that and relate to that in our house of i'm the person with less restrictions and my husband has celiac disease and you know a lot of times we'll run into of like oh well this is something we can both have but it tastes healthy or it doesn't or it feels like you're compromising and so being able to eat something that like when we ate one of the chocolate chip cookies the other day, it was like this, it, we're not compromising on anything. We're just eating an incredible chocolate chip cookie, but we can both have it. And it's just, it's very exciting. So I, I, I love that. Exactly. And that's why a lot of the feedback we get from our customers is that, you know, like a female customer will go buy the product, but then she'll tell us that like, she doesn't tell her partner that it's healthy or that it's gluten-free, that it's vegan because she doesn't want him to like, you know, turn away from it. And mm -hmm. he'll end up loving it just as much as she does. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Well, what else is like coming out up that we should keep an eye out for? Like anything that, you know, that's coming up either like from a marketing perspective or just from a business perspective that you're excited about for next year or we can stay tuned on? Yeah, we're really working on building out our shelf stable line. So we do have a baking, a chocolate chip baking mix, which is based off of our best selling chocolate chip cookie. Uh, but we're also working on things like a cake mix, 
um, we use a paleo baking powder in house that we make, mm-hmm. and there's not really anything on the market like that. Um, so I think that's a big opportunity for us as well. So just kind of like working on bake at home products. Yeah, that's awesome. That's super exciting. So yeah, everybody listening can go to nowhere, the the word nowherebakery.com. You can follow Nowhere Bakery on Instagram and then definitely like, you know, at your own risk because you're going to be super hungry and want to order all the cookies uh, possible, which, you know, I think is a great decision. So I'm an enabler here. Um, But yeah, I I think we should all go and check it out. And I can't wait to keep following you along and, and see how you continue to grow and just love the the treats and uh and you know helping people people eat delicious things i love what you're doing in the world so super glad for you and we're going to keep cheering you on at startup cpg thank you so much i really appreciate that well thanks for being on the show today and definitely look forward to staying in touch thank you for listening in today I'm so honored you joined me for this conversation and I love hearing from you all with feedback, suggestions, or if you just want to say hi at podcast at startupcpg.com or you can find me on LinkedIn. If you liked this episode, we'd love for you to share it with a friend or colleague, subscribe so you don't miss future episodes, and maybe even leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. If you aren't yet in our Slack community of founders and experts, We'd love to see you there. You can get the free invite at startupcpg.com and find all our other awesome resources there like webinars, databases, the blog, the magazine, and virtual and in-person events. And if you found yourself rocking out to our intro and outro music, which I do every single time, make sure to check out the Super Fantastics on Spotify. It's the band of our Startup CPG founder, Daniel Scharf. I'm Jesse Freitag, your host and producer, and on behalf of the whole team at Startup CPG, thank you for being here and see you next week.